Thanks, Julia. Uh, and I want to echo Jeff's comments, uh, appreciating all of y'all joining today. Um, I'm going to take a step back here and ask where PFAS can be found. And the, the map on that screen that you're looking at makes it pretty obvious. I like to start my PFAS presentations with a pretty blanket statement that PFAS is everywhere, right? So um, you can see some of the statistics, 2,200 contamination sites in the 49 states. Uh, we're you know, have ongoing detection and monitoring at the state level. Um, this is only in a groundwater and surface water, so these are really looking at um, uh, and, and soil contamination. Uh, this presentation is really focused on the drinking water and groundwater aspects of PFAS, and I understand there may be another seminar in the future looking more at the soils and the solids, so I want to explain the focus here a little bit being more on water. Um, there's a number of universities and government research uh, being undertaken both at the state and the federal level. And you can see some of these um, uh, organizations listed on the state are, are further resources where you might find information about uh, PFAS and the extent of contamination perhaps in, in your areas or areas of interest to you. Um, this is a nice uh, graphic because it's simple enough to follow, and yet it shows some of the complexity of PFAS in our water systems, but also how else people can be exposed um, to PFAS. So if you're thinking about you know, the public at large, uh, you, you look at those residential homes in the top right, and you can see one of the primary uh, areas of contamination is from drinking water. Um, but there are also uh, a number of ways that people can be exposed, um, including uh, exposure to consumer products, your um, fabric, uh, fabrics treated with uh, PFAS. So I always think of that new car smell is because it's what I do. I think of it, oh gosh, now I'm in inhaling PFAS because that upholstery has been treated with, with stain repellent um, compounds made from PFAS. Um, coatings on your food packaging, especially food, um, fast food packaging, and, and unfortunately also the compostable, the things that are supposed to be green, they're usually also coated with PFAS. Uh, and, and last but not least, there's, a, there's potential contamination just from the air uh, we breathe. There is, uh, it's not that the PFAS is free floating in the air, but it may well be attached to the particles that are around. So if you look into a, a ray of sun coming into the um, into your window, you can see how the air we breathe is always um, has fine little particulates in it, and there may be PFAS attached to those. So, you know, water certainly isn't the only medium um, by which PFAS ends up um, in uh, in people's uh, lives. Um, you can see some of the other things that are more more directly of interest to the, the audience today: soil, farmland. Um, out, land application of biosolids derived from uh, from wastewater treatment, for example, a lot of different areas in a very complex environmental problem that people are still working very hard on solving. The reason we're interested in these compounds is that uh, research is, is starting to really emerge on a number of PFAS uh, that they may have a wide range of health effects. And so I'm I'm calling it an association here because you know there's there there I would say there's a nearly smoking gun for some compounds. For example, PFOA being classified by the EPA as possibly carcinogenic, and it takes a lot for the EPA to to characterize something that way. But there's also links to a wide uh, other range of of health challenges, including osteoarthritis, cardiovascular di disease, difficulty becoming pregnant, um, etc. Um, so this is something that's really um, important and has, you know, not only a wide range of, um, of impact across the environment, but also a very large number of potential um, health impacts to people. And so I guess it's not surprising that now we are um, seeing, at, even at the federal level, a movement towards regulation in drinking water for PFOS and PFOA. I've put up on this slide uh, a flow diagram that conceptually shows all the stages that um, contaminants have to go through to be regulated in drinking water. Um, and the, you know, the stack on the left, the proposed CCL and the draft UCMR, all of that takes years and years to collect data and to understand, and PFAS have already gone through that process. Um, and we have now, as of February 2020, we're in that stage of final regulatory determination where the EPA has determined that it will uh, consider creating uh, maximum contaminant levels or regulated 
maximum levels in drinking water. Um, and so those are, um, that's kind of the last step before having real uh, drinking water limits. Um, and to put that in perspective, if you look at this slide, um, also provided by the American Water Works Association, and I don't need you to know every acronym on this graph, those are all of the various rules that have been promulgated uh, to regulate constituents in drinking water. And what I want you to notice is that starting in the 80s, there was kind of a quiet period. And then from the 90s to the 2000s, we had a number of rules that, uh, that were promulgated to um, limit the, the contaminants in drinking water. And then for the last 20 years, we've had very, very little. And so it is relatively unprecedented. And even those rules that we've had are really rehashings of existing rules, existing contaminants, rather than uh, identifying new ones. And so, um, you know, there's a real potential here that we might see regulation of PFAS as early as next year or maybe the year after that. And, and that's a really, that's a strong statement on the part of the EPA that these are important contaminants. 